Good morning. Welcome to Wednesday morning. Hope you had a really good nice rest and uh, you're ready for the day. Whether it's a day of quarantine where you shut up or you have to sneak out to go somewhere, you have a safe and wonderful day. It's supposed to be a beautiful day. Uh, I understand it's going to probably hit about 70, kind of nice to have some nice warm sunshine in the midst of everything else that is going on. Well, I have my coffee, so if you got whatever you're going to have this morning, coffee or juice or whatever, you know, get it, get your Bible, have your journals ready with a pen. Let's see what God has for us today. Uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, we want to come with our hearts open to you, thanking you for this spectacular day. Thinking, as I am right now, what the psalmist says, that uh, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, we will praise our God. And Lord, this is a day you've given us. We're going to rejoice in it. We're going to praise you no matter what it holds, no matter what happens. In the state that we find ourselves and the things that we're going through, we still praise you because you reign. You are sovereign. You are God. You're God over this time. I do pray, Lord, for those that are are ill, that are sick, that are suffering uh, from many ailments and things that are going on. But, Lord, I think of those that have been stricken with the, uh, uh, with the virus. And pray, Father, that uh, you will raise up treatment and a cure quickly. And that, Lord, we'll get past this point and we can get, get back to life normal where we can see people and be with people in the same space. I pray that you keep our folks protected. I thank you for those that are listening in. I thank you, Lord, for how you are working in their lives and their, their comments and their encouragement to me uh, to keep going through this time. You are blessed and wonderful and precious. Thank you, Lord. Now lead us in wisdom and understanding. Open to us the eyes of our understanding. Lord, we come to your word knowing that we need you to bring it to our heart. We praise you. We thank you. We come under the umbrella of your authority and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we've come to Wednesday of uh, what would be deemed Holy Week or Easter Week. Uh, it's a day that not uh, as much is written about. Uh, doesn't seem to have been as much activity, of course, as there was on Tuesday. Uh, but we do find two significant events in the day. First, this is the day that Judas finally makes up his mind. He makes his decision to betray Jesus and take the reward. And the other one, the second one, this is the day that Jesus is anointed with an expensive uh, oil from a broken alabaster jar by the woman from Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Now, though we will mention Judas, I'm not going in there. I want us to settle down and look at this act of extravagant devotion that we see in the life of Mary. Uh, so we want to look at the priority of extravagant devotion, uh, devotion and worship that needs to be poured out on our loving Savior. Uh, the scene opens up and finds Jesus and the disciples uh, reclining at a table, having dinner at Simon the leper's house. A man that is known by a disease that apparently he once carried, that apparently perhaps even Jesus had cured him of. Uh, and during that meal, uh, Mary slips in, uh, Mary of Bethany, Lazarus' sister, she comes in, uh, uh, unbeknownst to everybody, but her presence is soon going to be known as she breaks this alabaster jar and anoints the head and the feet of Jesus. Uh, when Mark and Matthew talk about this scene, uh, they record that it was all the disciples that joined with Judas in uh, rebuking her for wasting this, uh, this expensive perfume uh, on Jesus uh, because it could have been sold and, and portions of it used to help many, many poor people. But Jesus defends her, and really in the defense he rebukes them. In Matthew 26, verse 13, he says, I tell you the truth. 
wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world. Now, listen to these precious words. What she has done will also be told in memory of her. I mean, Mary has gone down in, in the annals of history, in the, in, in the uh, uh, chronicles of faith, as a woman of extravagant devotion to God. And that is her memorial even down to today. Uh, Watchman Nee was a uh, Chinese pastor and evangelist uh, that lived in uh, the mid, middle of last century. In fact, he was martyred in China. Uh, for his faith in the early 1950s. Uh, I got uh, introduced to him by my pastor, who when he was discipling me, one of the very first books he ever gave me to read and to digest, to go along with Ephesians, was Sit, Walk, Stand. The other one that he recommended and, and, and made me pour myself into was Wash My Knees, The Normal uh, Christian Life. In there, in that book, Watchman Nee takes this scene and he makes this comment. Jesus intends that the witness of the gospel should issue in something along the lines of the action of Mary here. Namely, that people should come to him and waste their selves, their lives, on him. Or to state it uh, probably a little bit more bluntly, the gospel should bring each of us to a true estimate of the true worth of Jesus that will lead us to just completely empty ourselves and give ourselves completely over to him. If Jesus, listen, is the pearl of great price, if he is the uh, hidden treasure out in the field taking those two parables that he draws, then it is not a waste to give up everything that you have in order to buy the pearl or acquire the lamb. Jesus is worthy. He is worthy today as he has always been. He is worthy for you to devote all that you are and all that you have to him. It is to him I owe everything. So this story is about how not to waste your life, how not to give up, uh, you know, not just spend your life on frivolous things. It is also a story about motivation. Why do we do what we do for Jesus? Why do we encourage people to give their life up to him? You see, the true motivation for serving Christ is because he is worthy, worthy of everything that you can do and everything that you can give and everything that you can say about him. And because you love him and you want to please him because he gave his life for you, for me, upon the cross. Well, John contrasts Mary's act of devotion with Judas's, uh, his self-centered focus, and the evil plans of the chief priests and the scribes, who now are, are, are not only wanting to kill Jesus, but they want to kill Lazarus, because it was the resurrection of Lazarus that, that caused so many people to turn and believe in Jesus. As we said, remember, way back on uh, uh, last Wednesday, that that was the trigger point. That was the monumental event that started all of this ball rolling, leading to the most significant event in human history. So the story is a lesson of a life spent in selfless devotion to Jesus. That life is not wasted. But the life spent on self-centered pursuits does become totally wasted. Like the man who spent his entire life climbing that ladder of success. And he gets to the very top and he looks around and realizes that the ladder has been propped on the wrong building all along. Jesus tells us what is the imperative for following him. 
what the imperatives of discipleship is. You can find that in Luke 9, but you also find it in Luke 14, verses 26 and 27. Jesus says very plainly, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his, 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 his father and his mother, his wife and his children, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And, and if, if, if whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, don't misunderstand what's being said here. Jesus is not contradicting himself in any way. He is not telling us to hate anyone. He's using strong language and strong words to show us that nothing and no one can ever be more important to us than Jesus. Mary denied herself for the sake of loving and following Christ. And she demonstrated it by this extravagant act of devotion that she poured out on him, and she gained that which could never be taken away from her. Now, Judas had uh, greedily wished that he could get into that pot, sell it so that he could keep some of the money for himself. And in just a few days, Judas is going to show his mettle because he is going to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Now, if you were to calculate that in today's dollars, that would be uh, about uh, $600. But he forfeited. <laughs> Excuse me, he forfeited his own soul. My friends, you will never, and I mean this, you'll never waste your life. If you spend it selfishly devoted to Jesus, Self -devo de selfless devotion is costly. And Mary's anointing of Jesus with this perfume was costly. And it was really costly in about three different ways. That this kind of devotion can also cost each and every one of us. First of all, it costs her materially. I think that's a pretty obvious one, but we want to look at it. As I, begin, as I begin this section, I want to ask you a question. Do you love Jesus more than stuff? More than all the stuff you can accumulate? Do you love him more? That's a pretty good question to, to ponder on, I think. And to look at day by day. You see, pure nard is a spice that came from the, the mountain regions of the Himalayas and in, in northern India. And it came to Israel in with great cost. Now, I don't know how Mary acquired such a, a, a costly item. It could have been an inheritance. It could have been a family heirloom. It could have been uh, from industrial. I, I have no idea. We know that she had it. Now, Judas estimates that uh, the cost of that three-quarters of a pound of nard would uh, be equivalent to about, uh, it would be about, he said, about 300 denarii. Now, that's equivalent to about 300 days' pay, a denarii per day. Now, if you were to do some simple calculation, figuring that the minimum wage at $15 an hour and figure... 300 eight-hour days, that adds up to about $36,000. Now get our minds around that. Think about that for a moment. When was the last time I poured out $36,000 worth of anything like that? Okay. Anyway, you figure it. Mary's actions were extravagantly costly. But was it really the most costly thing? When Jesus talks about the imperatives of following him in Matthew's gospel, he uses these words. Listen to Matthew 16, 26. For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world but forfeit his life? 
Or what can a person give in exchange for his life? Huh. Judas gained 30 pieces of silver, but he lost his soul. Mary, to her, nothing was as important as knowing and loving Jesus. And see what she gained. The beauty of it is, too often, too many uh, professing Christians live with the attitude of get all you can and can all you get and sit on it instead of valuing the things that are eternal. They seek to gobble up and acquire everything that is temporal or temporary, simply passing away. Let me say one thing at this point. If you were trusting in the stock market, well, what's been happening over the last three weeks? But if you're trusting in Jesus... Guess what has never changed? He's the still the most valuable diamond in the universe. He's priceless. Well, he's worthy of our unselfish devotion. Much more worthy than any material possession that we can acquire. He accepted the worship of Mary that she poured out on him because she rightly saw all that he was worthy of all she could give him and even more. As Isaac Watt puts it in the hymn that we sing so frequently, when I survey the runner's cross, the, the, the one verse says, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were present far too small. Love so amazing so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Mary sang that song that day. You see, the point is, devotion to Christ will cost you. It'll cost you materially. It'll cost you in time. It'll cost your talents. It's costly. But for every act of devotion I heap upon Christ, he heaps upon me dividend after dividend after dividend. But stop and think about one other thing. Paul says that, do you not know you are not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God. We're bought with a price. Calvary's blood purchased me. So when you get down to it, nothing I have is really mine anyway. He owns it all. And if it's his, can he direct it to be used in any way, in anywhere, at any time he wishes to direct it? Those are thoughts to ponder today. Secondly, it also cost her societally, socially, it cost her. I mean, think about it. Matthew and Mark say that Mary anointed the head of Jesus, while John's gospel says something else. She anointed his feet. Listen to John 12 and verse 3. Then Mary took three quarters of a pound of expensive aromatic oil from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus, and then she wiped his feet with her hair. Now, Matthew and Mark, I think, uh, emphasize the anointing of his head because the doing of the head speaks of kingship. However, John, the gospel, the, the, the disciple whom he loved, John emphasizes the anointing of his feet because it was a lowly, humble task for a servant. There is a beautiful parallel that can be found because in the very next chapter, John tells how Jesus girded himself about, took some water and a, pan, and, and a pan, and washed the feet of the disciples as a great act of humility and service that they were to follow. But Mary didn't use a towel. Mary unbraided her hair and let it fall down and used her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. 
Well, respectable Jewish women never let their hair down in public. In fact, he was considered uh, when some, by some that, that it was the act of a woman with loose morals. But Mary was so caught up in her love so caught up in her devotion to Christ that she didn't stop for one minute to consider what other people would think about her. It just didn't matter. Mary cast public opinion to the wind and let her hair down and wiped the feet of Jesus. Well, you see, Jesus didn't hold people's opinion in very high honor either, did he? In fact, I think Jesus would have really much preferred the title that would give him that this man loved sinners. He was the friend of sinners. He didn't usually find him in positions where he was being patted on the back for what he taught but often criticized for the people he associated himself with and the things that he did. Now, Paul asks a probing question in Galatians that I think we ought to have probe us a little bit. In Galatians 1.10, he says, I am, am I now trying to gain the approval of people or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a slave to Christ. That's a pretty good question. It's a question that you and I ought to look at and examine within our own heart and our own life today. When we, when, when, when we consider you know, uh, focusing upon the cross, who do I want to please today? Because I could say, who am I going to please tomorrow or the next day? But... We have today. So the question is, who do I want to please the most today? Well, ask yourself, do you treasure Jesus more than anything? Do I treasure him more than my pride? Or am I more concerned about what other people think about me? What truly matters is not what other people think about us. What truly matters is what Jesus thinks. So, may I lavish my worship and devotion upon him. The third thing that cost Mary, it cost her critically. Judas led the attack, but the other disciples chime in. Matthew 26, 8 says, But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, why this waste? Well, after all, they were only being pragmatic, right? They were being sensible in all of this, weren't they? After all, the money could, uh, the perfume could be sold and that huge amount of money could have certainly taken care of a great many poor and still had some left over. So why waste it? Or was it really wasted? Count on it. If you give yourself without reserve to Jesus, you will be criticized. And sometimes you'll be criticized by the people who are closest to you. In our first church years ago, God got a hold of a young college student. And uh, he surrendered to God to missions. Oh, how he had a desire to go out on mission. He was so excited about what God was doing in his life. When we finished praying and he got up, he immediately went home to tell his parents. He was so excited. They were wonderful people, such strong, wonderful Christian, strong supporters of the church. However, when he shared his exciting news to them, with them, their reaction was not what he or I would have expected. Instead of rejoicing with him, they uh, threatened to cut him off, to stop paying for his college unless he changed his mind and gave up this silly notion of wasting his life that way in some desolate, far-off land. Years ago, I wrote down his response that he gave his parents. They gave it to me, so 
His reaction was to say to them, I, I love you more than I can ever say. And I'm grateful for all that you have taught me and all that you've done for me. But I owe everything to my Savior who gave everything for me. And I know he will provide everything I need because I know he wants me going to the ends of the earth to tell those who have not heard of the love he has for them. Well, I'd ask you this question. Did that young man waste his life? I don't think so. He didn't waste his life. He spent his life. He invested his life. He gave his life. And my friends, God paid him back with great dividends that will pay out through eternity. But now, let me let you in on the end of the story. I don't want to leave you hanging. I'll use a Paul Harvey term. Now to the end of the story. It wasn't long before God was able to break into the hearts of, of these wonderful parents and, and humble them. And uh, uh, in that uh, humbling, they came and they, they gave themselves to Christ in such a new and deeper way. And they experienced a deeper and more profound devotion for Christ than they had ever thought possible within their own life. In fact, I don't know how many times they ended up going on the mission field giving themselves at every opportunity. Why? Because they learned that he is worthy. They learned not he is worthy here, but they learned that he is worthy here of all our love and all our devotion. If God could give his son for them, then they could give their son to him. That's what they learned. So where does this love, where does this kind of devotion come from? Well, I think it comes from a deep, deep love and gratitude to him and for him. Mary knew more about the infinite worth of Jesus at that point in time, at that night, than any of the disciples sitting around that table with him. Her personal knowledge of Jesus was gained by sitting at the feet of Jesus. You see, before this time, we hear of Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. We hear of another time where she rejoiced in having received her brother back from the dead. And she was so grateful to Jesus. Oh, how she loved him. Oh, how she was grateful for all that he has done. It is this kind of love, the love that he has for us, that he pours into our heart that compels us to devotion and worship. Paul writes to the church in Corinth in the, his second letter in the fifth chapter, for the love of Christ controls us, constrains us, motivates us. Since we have concluded this, that Christ died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. Does love compel you today? Ponder that question. This beautiful beauty of this act is, is left for us an eternal testimony of the beauty of unrestrained worship and extravagant devotion that comes from a sincere heart. In the same way that it took the breaking of that alabaster jar to pour out and to fill the room with the fragrance of that perfume, so the beautiful fragrance of Christ will flow from our lives when self is broken, so Christ can reign. As the sweet fragrance of her offering filled the room, 
So does the free, sweet fragrance of Christ fill our worship in the place where we live. Does your life give off that fragrant aroma of Christ? Is your worship a pleasing aroma for God who loves you? Learn the lesson that comes at the feet of Jesus, where a woman is anointing not only his head but his feet, and an extravagant devotion, wiping them and drying them with her hair. Father, it is with humble, filled hearts that we come in gratitude for the witness of Mary. Lord, if we were to measure our devotion, our extravagance up against this one woman that you have left as a testimony through the ages, how would we stack up? Oh, Lord, do you have all of our heart, all of our, our emotions, all of our mind, all of our strength. Do we come daily with a great Shema upon our heart, loving you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then letting that flow out and loving others, Lord, like you have loved us. You are blessed. You are wonderful. You gave everything for us. Lord, I pray that we will examine and if we are holding anything back, that we will give it to you, for it all belongs to you. Lord, today, let us give the moments of this day to you. Let us be mindful, Lord, even in the situation we're in, in our homes or, or taking a walk, that, Lord, be mindful that you are there and you are working. And, Lord, we just need to spend ourselves on you in extravagant love. Bless us, Lord, as we go out. Fill us, Lord, with your purpose. Thank you, Jesus. We come under the umbrella of your authority in great love and honor to you. And we pray, precious Jesus, in your name, humbly, amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Be good to one another today. Be careful. Be safe. Spend yourself on him. May God bless you.